1963, the NASA Langley Research Center released this film entitled Hazards of Tire Hydroplaning to Aircraft Operation. This film explains the phenomenon of dynamic tire hydroplaning and shows how it is influenced by such factors as aircraft speed, depth of water on the runway, runway texture, and condition of the tire tread. This film tells the story as it was then known. And now we will discuss some new information obtained through the intensive research being conducted in this country and abroad. This landing aircraft is experiencing a loss of tire braking action due to hydroplaning. Since it is in danger of overrunning the 12,000 foot runway, the pilot elects to go off the side and stop rather than run off the end of the runway and into a lake. During this landing in a bed of slush, a nine knot crosswind from the right causes the hydroplaning aircraft to weathercock into the wind and drift laterally. The pilot regains control when lateral tire traction is established on the dry runway. From this view, we also see the weathercocking and lateral drifting. Loss of braking and lateral traction such as you have just seen are now regarded as being caused by three phenomena, either singly or in combination. First, there is dynamic hydroplaning, which was discussed extensively in the previous film. Second, there is the more familiar thin film lubrication, or viscous skidding. And finally, there is the phenomenon of so-called reverted rubber skidding. In this example of dynamic hydroplaning, the tires are running on a test runway covered with one half inch of water. The tires spin down to a complete stop, even though the test wheels are not equipped with brakes. After the tires stop rotating, braking would be ineffective. Thus, during dynamic hydroplaning, long skids are encountered and the brakes are useless. Loss of braking and lateral traction is also caused by thin film lubrication, or viscous skidding which is shown at the end of this braking test run. A very smooth runway surface is required for viscous skidding to occur. And since these first concrete and asphalt test surfaces are well textured, the tire spins up rapidly following brake relief. This indicates good tire traction. This last part of the test surface, however, consists of smooth ice covered with a thin film of water. The viscous skidding and extreme loss of traction is indicated by the very slow spin-up of the tire following brake relief. On active runways, smooth sections which might promote viscous skidding are seen in the touchdown area. Here, molten tire rubber which was deposited during dry touchdowns makes the runway very smooth. On this 10,000 foot runway, a section of 2,000 feet at each end is covered with smooth rubber deposits. The third phenomenon which causes loss of braking and lateral traction is the reverted rubber skid. This type of skid is illustrated in this landing of a B-58 aircraft on the wet runway. During this landing, the tires on the left did not rotate for over 3,000 feet of rollout, even though the brakes were cycling and the anti-skid control was reducing the brake pressure to zero. Skid patches were formed on the tire the rubber appeared to have reverted to its uncured state. Similar skid patches have been observed on tires from many other aircraft which have encountered long, uncontrollable skids and low tire traction. The low traction values developed by a tire riding on a reverted rubber skid patch have been confirmed at the landing loads track of the Langley Research Center. This locked tire is sliding on a wet runway and the friction coefficients measured under these conditions are negligible. A footprint or skid patch section taken from this test tire shows a typical reverted rubber condition. This sequence taken from a film produced by the Royal Aircraft Establishment illustrates the effect of tire skidding on the flow of water in the footprint area. As long as the tire is rotating within the four foot drum, plastic particles in the water pass through the footprint. When the tire stops turning, however, the particles indicate that water is trapped in the footprint and circulates in eddies. This dynamometer drum at the Dunlop Rubber Company 
is rotating at 120 miles per hour. And with the wheel and tire locked, water is being injected between the tire and the drum. Steam is produced and reverted rubber is formed on the tire in the contact patch. According to a theory first proposed by Overtop, the steam produced in the footprint supports most of the tire's vertical load and causes the observed low values of tire traction. Because of the loss of traction associated with dynamic hydroplaning, thin film lubrication, and reverted rubber skids, we are now seeking ways to avoid these phenomena. An air jet may be used to blow water out of the tire path and thereby alleviate hydroplaning to a considerable degree. The air jet principle is illustrated by this test which was photographed upward through a glass plate. In this test, an automobile tire without an air jet is rolling at 50 miles per hour over a glass plate that is covered with three tenths of an inch of water. The lack of visibility of any part of the tire indicates that hydroplaning is occurring. With an air jet to blow water out of the tire path, the footprint is entirely black, showing that the air jet has removed the water. Drag measurements also show that tire traction is increased markedly. Full-scale tests of air jets have been made by Douglas Aircraft Company. This aircraft is traveling at 120 feet per second through water three-tenths of an inch deep. With the air jets not operating, the brakes are applied to stop wheel rotation and then released. Wheels fail to spin back up because of tire hydroplaning. With the air jets blowing the water away, the brakes are again applied and then released. The wheels spin up quickly, indicating a high friction coefficient between the tire and the runway. The braking friction measurements made by Douglas Aircraft are summarized on this chart. The top curve shows the variation of braking friction coefficients between the tire and a dry runway. This bottom curve shows the braking friction coefficients which were experienced by the airplane when the runway was flooded. The center curve, however, indicates that when the air jets were used on the flooded runway, a considerable improvement in braking friction was obtained. The use of air jets can also improve cornering traction on wet runways if the surface is textured. Without the air jet, cornering force is negligible. But with the air jet on a textured surface, the tire develops about 60% of the dry runway cornering force. The air jet, however, is ineffective on very smooth concrete because it cannot remove the last film of water, and this residual film can cause viscous skidding. Another method for combating the loss of traction which occurs on wet runways is to use grooves in the runway. This method has been used in a limited way on runways in England and on roads in the United States. Grooving is effective in greatly reducing all three types of traction losses. Its effect on dynamic hydroplaning is shown in these results of tests made by Gray in England. An airplane was taxied at a speed sufficient for dynamic hydroplaning, first over an ungrooved runway and then over a grooved section. The clearance of the tire above the runway or above the top of the grooved section was measured for different depths of water on the runway. On the ungrooved section, hydroplaning occurred when 18 hundredths of an inch of water was present, while on the grooved section, over four-tenths of an inch was required for hydroplaning. While dynamic hydroplaning can occur on a grooved runway if the water is deep enough, it is unlikely to occur on a properly drained runway and should not be a problem unless ponding is allowed. Reverted rubber skidding is perhaps the most insidious type of traction loss and even this condition appears to be alleviated by the use of grooving. In these results from a test at the Langley track, a tire in a reverted rubber skid approaches from the left on a smooth surface and then encounters a grooved section. The braking friction values are seen to improve Automatically when the grooves are reached. These grooves break up any water film and tend to make viscous skidding impossible. Although grooving has been shown to be a very effective way to maintain traction on wet runways, the most effective combination of groove size
spacing and direction has not yet been determined. Here are test sections being grooved transversely for use at the Langley track. Groove widths of 1 8, 1 quarter, and 3 eighths of an inch will be tested at spacings of 1, 1 and a half, and 2 inches. Breaking tests on these surfaces will provide a basis for specifying groove patterns. While the above tests are being conducted, qualitative tests with a motor scooter can be cited to support transverse grooving. When a scooter tire is run over a dry glass plate, the yellow strings attached to the glass are in a random pattern. The test is repeated over the glass plate covered with three tenths of an inch of water, and the tufts indicate a predominantly sideways motion of the water when it escapes from the tire footprint. It may thus be inferred that grooves in the direction of the water escape would offer the best arrangement. Qualitative consideration of this diagram also points to the use of transverse grooves. Water enters the footprint in a sheet at the front. Pressure between the tire and the runway forces the water into either tire or runway grooves, and the water must escape along the groove to the edge of the footprint. In deeply flooded conditions, where there is danger of choking the grooves, transverse runway grooves obviously offer the shortest path of escape, and there are more groove exits along the edge of the footprint than there are at either end. These results from a tire test made at 97 knots show that the cornering force developed on ungrooved dry concrete is lost completely if the runway is flooded. On a grooved and flooded runway, however, a substantial side force is developed. Another factor which can cause the loss of side force capability, even on dry concrete, is heavy braking. If the brakes are applied so as to make the tires operate at slip ratios greater than is required for maximum braking, as is done with current anti-skid systems, loss of side force capability is very severe, especially on wet runways. Work is also underway at Langley on an anti-skid system which will not allow the tire to experience excessive slip ratios beyond the peak of the braking curve. This system should maintain spin-up and side force capability, which will be very beneficial in preventing long skids and in preventing the development of reverted rubber skid patches. Thus the loss in braking and cornering traction, which is experienced by aircraft on wet runways, can be due to dynamic hydroplaning, viscous skidding, or to reverted rubber skidding. The use of air jets to blow water from the path of the tire is beneficial in alleviating dynamic hydroplaning, but it is not effective in eliminating viscous skidding on smooth surfaces. Runway grooving, however, is effective in combating all known causes of loss in tire traction on wet runways. Extensive research is continuing to develop the air jet, runway grooving, and improved anti-skid systems. Other means for maintaining traction on wet surfaces are also being sought to further improve the safety of aircraft and automobile operations.
water. The viscous skidding and extreme loss of traction is indicated by the very slow spin-up of the tire following brake relief. On active runways, smooth sections which might promote viscous skidding are seen in the touchdown area. Here, molten tire rubber, which was deposited during dry touchdowns, makes the runway very smooth. On this 10,000-foot runway, a section of 2,000 feet at each end is covered with smooth rubber deposits. The third phenomenon which causes loss of braking and lateral traction is the reverted rubber skid. This type of skid is illustrated in this landing of a B-58 aircraft on the wet runway. During this landing, the tires on the left did not rotate for over 3,000 feet of rollout, even though the brakes were issued. This film explains the phenomenon of dynamic tire hydroplaning and shows how it is influenced by such factors as aircraft speed, depth of water on the runway, runway texture, and condition of the tire tread. This film tells the story as it was then known. And now we will discuss some new information obtained through the intensive research being conducted in this country and abroad. This landing aircraft is experiencing a loss of tire braking action due to hydroplaning. Since it is in danger of overrunning the 12,000 foot runway, the pilot elects to go off the side and stop rather than run off the end of the runway and into a lake. During this landing in a bed of slush, a nine-knot crosswind from the right causes the hydroplaning aircraft to weather a runway covered with one half inch of water. The tires spin down to a complete stop, even though the test wheels are not equipped with brakes. After the tires stop rotating, braking would be ineffective. Thus, during dynamic hydroplaning, long skids are encountered and the brakes are useless. Loss of braking and lateral traction is also caused by thin film lubrication, or viscous skidding, which is shown at the end of this braking test run. A very smooth runway surface is required for viscous skidding to occur. And since these first concrete and asphalt test surfaces are well textured, the tire spins up rapidly following brake relief. This indicates good tire traction. This last part of the test surface, however, consists of smooth ice covered with a thin film of In 1963, the NASA Langley Research Center released this film entitled Hazards of Tire Hydroplaning to Aircraft Operate Rock into the Wind and Drift Laterally. The pilot regains control when lateral tire traction is established on the dry runway. From this view, we also see the weather cocking and lateral drifting. Loss of braking and lateral traction such as you have just seen, are now regarded as being caused by three phenomena, either singly or in combination. First, there is dynamic hydroplaning, which was discussed extensively in the previous film. Second, there is the more familiar thin film lubrication, or viscous skidding. And finally, there is the phenomenon of so-called reverted rubber skidding. In this example of dynamic hydroplaning, the tires are running on a test